Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 30th, 2020, and this is a week in charts. I actually want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I'm uh, impressed that the people found the show. It seems like people still tr having trouble finding the show, and, and I've been doing a poor job of promoting. I've just been so busy working on the show on Thursdays, I always forget to get the link out and all. So you guys who found the show obviously are trying pretty hard, and I appreciate that. And some of this stuff does go to spam and, and uh, promotional photos, et cetera. So you have to check your spam filters too. But once you're signed in, you should be good for the next shows, unless I forget to schedule one. Also, if you check the home page and scroll down to the bottom, that's DaveLander.com. For those who are watching the YouTube recording, would love to have you live here. Do that and bring your favorite stock picks and bring your questions. We'll be happy to take a look at your questions and your stock picks. All right, so what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions is the main focus this week. Is this a new bull? What are the signs and systems saying? I want to follow up on a lot of things we've been talking about recently. There's a claim screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or, as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Lately, I've been doing bear market updates. I was doing them about every day for a while, and now that the market's kind of working its way higher in here and not a whole lot has changed, I haven't been doing them quite as often. But if you check on my website for now, I'm going to keep this up here for a while and continue to talk about what's happening as things unfold. And I think we could be pretty important inflection point really soon. And we'll talk about that today. But if you want to check those updates, go here, check the homepage page first. I've been talking quite a bit over the last, I guess, couple of years now about the TFM 10% temper system, 10 system. And all I'm doing is looking to get out of a market when it closes 10% or more away from this 50 week closing high and closes below the 50 week moving average. And we'll pick those signals apart a little bit in a minute. So if you take a look at the market, and here I have a weekly S&P 500, the top line is the 50-week closing high. The bottom histogram that you're seeing is percent away from that closing high. And then notice that as the 52-week highs or as the market makes new 52-week closing highs, that line goes up, the blue line. And then notice it goes sideways when the market fails to make new 50 week closing highs and then begins to go up as the market makes new closing highs again. Now the bottom line is what I call the buy line and you wanna to look to buy as long as you are above the buy line with the caveat that you also wanna have two lows above the 50 week moving average and that's just a little whipsaw filter in there and also on the sell side, a close below the 50 week moving average is necessary. So putting the moving average in there, you could see that this ribbon down here stays bearish as long, I'm sorry, bullish, as long as the lows are greater than the 50-week moving average and the close is above the buy line, okay? So if you look at the histogram up top, you'll see that I have a line at 10%. So as long as you're below 10%, and especially if the lows are greater than the moving average, that's bullish. Now, you'll notice that it did cross below the 50-week moving average, but it was still above the buy line, so it became neutral, and then we had a sell signal back in December of 2018. Now, this has once again turned bearish. Why? Well, because we have closed below the, the buy line. Notice the histogram up top has gone above 10% as far as the market drop is concerned and the close is less than the moving average, the 50-week moving average, and the close is less also than the buy line. So we're more than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. So you can see there's a the close, there's the moving average. We're below both the buy line and the 50-week moving average. Now, to my amazement, we've come right back, and I'm going to talk a little bit about V-shaped recoveries in just one second. When we get to the live charts, I'd like to take a look at that. Now, a few weeks ago, I introduced a premise that the longer it stays bullish, the longer it stays bullish, and the longer it stays bearish, the longer it stays bearish. Now, one caveat I was thinking about, or one thing I was thinking about, is that markets do tend to go up more than markets go down, because they go fast, go down a lot faster than they go up. 
They take the escalator up and then they take the elevator down, the old Wall Street adage, which is fairly true, especially in this last case, although they seem to be taking the elevator back up. But as a general statement, the longer you have a trend indicator stay green, the longer it will continue to stay green. Or maybe better said, if it stays green for a while, then it's to stay green for a while longer. And on the downside, if it stays red for a while, it's likely to stay red for a while longer. Now, I haven't defined what a while is, but as you can see in these charts that I'll show you right here, for instance, it stayed green for a while, and then it stayed green for a while longer. Now, will this continue to stay bearish? I don't know. Has it stayed bearish long enough? And this V-shaped recovery could mess up that theory a little bit. Now, longer term, if we're looking at something like Landry Light on a 50-week moving average basis, you can see that after it stays green for a while, it generally stays green for a while longer. And in bear markets, obviously, after it stays, stays red for a while, then it stays red for a while longer. So the point I'm trying to make is when a market is doing well and does well for a while, then it's likely to continue to do well. When it starts doing poorly and continues to do poorly for a while, it's likely to continue to start doing poorly or continue to do poorly, I should say. So you can see if you go forward in time back to, let's say, the bull market that started in 2003, it stayed green for a considerable amount of time. Then it stayed mostly green for a considerable amount of time longer. On the downside, it went red for a while. And this indicator just counts the number of days, the lows or below the moving average or the highs or below the moving average. So I hope I said that right. It counts the number of days that the highs are below the moving average for downtrends and the lows are above the moving average for uptrends. So again, after it stays red for a while, continues to stay red. After it's green for a while, it generally stays green or mostly green. And you can go in and look at all of the bull and bear markets throughout history. Now, even though after it stays green for a while, you've got to be careful not to ignore the reds when they show up. And as I've preached, the 2015, 2016, whatever you want to call that correction, if you want to call it that, that was fairly ugly. And I remember trading was really tough back then. And you certainly didn't want to hold on to your longs, especially those that you established before, that whatever you want to call that choppy trading or correction. And then as I've been beating the dead horse ever since 2000. In 18, December of 2018, that is, you certainly don't want to ignore it when it just has a little bit of red. Yes, yeah, sometimes it goes red a little bit and turns right back green, but you certainly can't ignore that. And obviously, you have to be prudent on a much, much shorter term basis. Now, keep in mind right now, I'm talking about longer term trend following, longer term market timing. And as you can see now, obviously, we once again turn red, meaning that the highs are less than the moving average. And we had about a 30% spill, and I don't know the exact measurement peak to trough, and we'll take a look at that possibly. We'll get an idea of that when we look at the results of the TFM 10% system in a few minutes here. So again, my question is, how long before red begets more red? And what I'm kind of thinking out loud as kind of a thought experiment, and I'd be happy for, or I'd love for you guys to, pick up the ball and run with some research. The guys in the Facebook group have been fin fantastic. Hey, girls. And the girls have been quiet, though, lately. I have to, got to find out what's going on, ladies. Y'all need to chime in a little bit. Anyway, y'all been fantastic as far as presenting research of your own. And we've been kind of noodling with that and picking things apart. And it's been kind of, kind of fun. So this might be fodder for some more research. But I do think the longer we stay red and pick your favorite indicator, just below a moving average or whatever, the more chances we have of staying red. And I think we could be at an inflection point, as we'll flesh out quite a bit, when we get to the overall market in the live charts. Now, if we're looking at 
the TFM 10% system, and we're looking at the buy line, okay, which means that the market is within 10% of its high. There's two ways to get there. One price would obviously have to rally above the moving average. The low would have to rally above the moving average, okay? It'd have to be, you'd have to have a bar of daylight, and actually for the system, you need two bars of daylight. And then the close would also have to be above the buy line for that to occur. So that would switch us from bear mode back into bull mode. The other thing, as I've been talking about for past for the past several weeks, the other thing that would have to happen would be the buy line and the moving average, for that matter, would have to begin to drop to come down to meet price. Now, we're only 11 weeks into this slide, and 11 weeks since we made the all-time closing high on a weekly basis in the S&P 500. So it's going to take 39 weeks for that to start to drop. But after 39 weeks, it's going to drop really quick. By the way, as I'm going to talk about a little bit in a few minutes, there is lag in trend following. There is lag in longer term trend following systems when it comes to market timing. And as I've said in prior weeks, sometimes that lag isn't bad. Sometimes that lag stops you from chasing your own tail. Now, I've talked to somebody who's been long based on their timing systems off the lows, but they've got knocked out a couple times. So I haven't seen what their results are. They seem confident that they're on the right side of the market, even though they got whipsawed out a couple times. So the more accurate your system is at catching that bottom, the more likely your system is to shake you out. Conversely, obviously, the sooner you're in the market. And hope that I hope that made sense. We'll talk about lag here in just one second. Now, let's take a look at the weekly bow tie sell signals. And this indicator here, this is in Metastock, and it's if you if you own Metastock, you get this for free. And if you do look to get Metastock, get it off of my website. Click on the big uh, button on the home page. It says new to trading or data's methodology and use the affiliate link there. I appreciate that. I use a lot of tools, by the way, in my analysis. I use Finviz. There's a link for Finviz also in that link. In more recent times, I've been working with the good folks over at stockcharts.com and they've been real accommodating for me. I've actually, it's my fault in some cases because I haven't followed up the program. In fact, I got an email from him. I think on Wednesday, I haven't gotten around to opening just yet. By the way, if you are emailing me directly and looking for answers, if you're in the Facebook group, that's usually the quickest way to reach me. And then after the conversations go back and forth a couple of times, usually what I'll say is let's just take it over to Facebook and that way everybody can benefit. The uh, one to many model doesn't, one to one model, I should say, of me answering every single email directly doesn't work as well as it used to. Or if you don't mind waiting a couple of months for an answer, and sorry about that. Now, the uptrend proper order is the green. Now, by proper order, I simply mean the 10 simple is greater than the 20 exponential, and the 20 exponential is greater than the 30 exponential. So if you look at this indicator on a chart, you can see that if you mostly stay long when the moving averages are in uptrend proper order, you're going to do okay as far as being on the right side of the market. And if you mostly stay out of the market or even short when the moving averages are in downtrend proper order, you'll stay on the right side of the market, especially, of course, if a bear market develops. And once again, pick your favorite trend indicator. But my theory is that the longer something stays bearish, the longer it will likely to continue to stay bearish. And I think if I have to wrap my head around that, let's say you're nearing retirement and this market bounces back, and it's not quite to a bullish standpoint by these indicators, okay, or whatever means you want to look at, or even percent off of lows. But you're getting closer and closer and closer and closer to that retirement, and you're thinking like, well, let me just see if it comes back. And if it's not coming back, you might be inspired to lighten up or just outright get out 
of the market for peace of mind so you don't have to go back to work for a year or maybe even 25 years as I'll touch upon in just one second. So I think bearishness and pick your favorite indicator for that can beget more bearishness. And keep in mind, we're looking at a much, much longer term chart on a daily chart, sometimes you just have to get out of the way, as I would talk about in a few seconds, something we talked about last week. I'm just going to kind of touch upon it. But last week we talked about the market doing the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner and also causing the most amount of pain in the most amount of people. And as far as the shorts are concerned, I think the most amount of pain has been accomplished. I was talking with someone yesterday and I said, well, I've got like one or two shorts left. I've been just painfully squeezed on these and we did really well at least initially made a lot of money going down but then on the way back up the retrace rallies as you know suck so probably the day that my last short squeeze is out and i was close to being flat yesterday will be the absolute top of this market now this weekly bow tie here and this is actually programmed again into metastock you can see we had a buy signal recently. Now, technically, 25.50 will be the trigger on that. And as the market pulls back, a more aggressive entry would be maybe around 2,700 and change, or even 28.50 if you're following these weekly timing signals. Longer term, you can take a look at the proper order on these moving averages. And you can see that they stay bullish or green for a long time when the market's going up. When the market's going down, like it did in 2000, it's kind of interesting. When the market sort of makes a gradual rollover, those moving averages catch up really quick. And that's kind of cool because, as you can see in this chart, in 2000, you had downtrend proper order. And notice that you had a couple times when things were neutral, but not bullish during that entire downtrend from 2000 all the way until 2003, meaning that the 10 week simple moving average was below the 20 week exponential moving average and the 20 week exponential moving average was below the 30 week exponential moving average. And then one or two of those may have crossed, but not all three sometimes during that period and then what's fascinating to me at least and i'm a nerd i know you're probably thinking hey i want to party with this dude but from 2003 on all the way until 2007 and then again what amazes me is look at where that sell signal is fyi with the bow tie notice that it is pretty close to 2007 i always talk about the 2007 bear market and people will talk about the 2009 bear market but you can see that those signals came out late 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 2007 and we had plenty of other signals in 2007 late 2007 early early 2008 but there was it was mostly green during that entire period you had a couple of neutral times where the moving averages began to kind of meander together and maybe the 10 was above the 20 for a brief period of time, and that's when you can see it, it goes neutral in here. And then again, rinse and repeat, 2008 again, mostly red. In fact, it was red and, and no green, and only a little bit of neutral up until the bottom in 2009 where it turned green again. And anyway, rinse and repeat. You can see that mostly green, you did have a little red, again, that should not have been ignored, 2015, 2016. And then we, we went back to being green for a long time, a little red in 2018 that should not have been ignored. And then a little green or a lot of green in between. And then of course, we're back to being red, which should not have been ignored. Obviously you should have honored your stops on existing longs and considered some short side setups. Now let's take a look at the daily bow ties and notice that the daily bow tie moving averages came together really tight and made a beautiful bow tie in late February 
And what's cool about this is it was coming off of all time highs. Now, as I preach a bow tie off of major, major lows, let's say a five or a 10 year low or a 13 year low like 2009, that's a significant signal. A bow tie coming off of all time highs like you see here in any market, but I like to look at the, we're focused on the indices today, and especially in the indices, can be a significant signal. So, and I think, What's fascinating is, as I've said quite a bit, the longer term TFM 10% system, which is a weekly chart based, triggered before the daily did because all that takes is price to drop a certain amount, 10%, and be below the 50 week moving average. Anyway, the daily bow tie, you had an entry there or more aggressive entry, a little bit higher in the pullback. And you could see that turned out to be a pretty decent signal obviously to the downside these come along once every 10 years maybe where they're just this pretty but you can see it's worth to pay attention for when they do now when i had the programmer program this i didn't have time to look at the code this morning but you could see this is a sloppy bow tie meaning that it took more than several bars okay so this is daily bar so more than several days for the moving averages to come together and flip to uptrend proper order. So notice they're green, but notice there's no little bow tie signal on the chart, and that's because the moving averages are sloppy. Also, as I've said in weeks prior, we're not coming off of many year lows. It's a two year low, which is significant, don't get me wrong, the March lows that we saw but it's not like it's a 10 year low or something. So the bow ties are a little sloppy, but if you're just looking at the trend signal as proper order in and of itself, then yes, it is, we're now in uptrend proper order and technically all that would have to happen for a buy signal would be for a bow tie would be for us to have a one bar at least pullback and ideally a lower low and a lower high. I don't know if I would really call that a bow tie, especially now that the software is pointing it out to me that this thing is really sloppy and I need to see what he has programmed in. And I remember being kind of lenient when I gave him the code or the parameters, I should say, for this. So it's sloppy, but we are in uptrend proper order on our daily chart. Now, as I've been saying recently, and I think I've been talking about this also in my stockcharts.com show, Stock Charts TV show, the daily signals or bullish or turning bullish but the weekly signals are still bearish so those two are conflicting with one another now what i'm wondering as i hinted to earlier is is the most pain unfolding and i've got this from linda rasky and she said she picked it up on the floor probably she didn't even realize she had said it but she said the market will have to do what it has to do to cause the most amount of pain and the most amount of people. I know I've been preaching that in nauseam. So is the most pain unfolding? Well, the bottom fishers have certainly been rewarded lately. And, you know, as I've been saying, the man on the street is a microcosm. I've had a lot of friends and relatives call me wanting to buy stocks because they thought they were a value. I think the buy and hope has been rewarded. As I've said before, man on the street, I've heard people say in 2018, man, I'm glad I hold up, held on. I wish I would have bought more, one in particular. So I'm wondering if he's glad he held on once again, and I'm wondering if he bought more. And as I preach ad nauseum, the market could be a really, really bad teacher, teaching you to do some really bad things. What's kind of interesting is the shoe shine boys abound. Now, I'm not that old, I'm old, but I'm not that old. But if you read classical books on technical analysis, which I really enjoy doing, I know you probably want to party with me, right? <laughs> You'll see they talk about the shoe shine boys. And when the shoe shine boys start giving you tips on the stock market, that's when you begin to get a little concerned. My wife, just for fun sometimes, she likes to buy a lottery ticket. And obviously, she knows our odds are against her and all. I know it's kind of foolish behavior, but what's a doll, right? And she it's like she doesn't want to buy a Powerball because she doesn't want to win that much money. She just wants to win the little state lottery. And she's very 
altruistic and could be altruistic. She's all she'll like she'll give away something. <laughs> and later that day, I'll be like, where's the where's this? And it's like I have a, a steamer, for instance, for my green screen to get the wrinkles out, you know, and when we moved and I started unfolding my green screen and putting my office back together. I'm like, where's the steamer? She's like, oh, I, I gave that away yesterday. <laughs> it's like. Well, you hadn't used it in a while. It's like, well, a green screen's been in storage. Anyway, she could be a little altruistic. And long story endless, she'll probably give it all away anyway. But anyway, when she was at the gas station yesterday, there were two teenage kids behind the counter. And she's like, well, what do y'all want if I win? And they both at the same time said, money to trade the stock market. And they turned to each other. And they high five because they jinxed one another, obviously not practicing social distancing. So that's another example of the shoe shine boys. As I would say, quite a bit. Neighbors have been telling me about so and so, their friend is trading now. The contractor for the wood in our house is building the house right next door, literally right next door. And he hollered at me about a week or so ago. And we were talking, I'm trying to get some wood from him or waiting for some wood from him for a honeydew project. Anyway, he wants to get into trading. And so I'm like, okay, because he's seen his friends trade and do really well. And so I said, look, you got to be really prudent. You don't just want to jump into this. You wouldn't jump into the woodworking business without knowing anything. So take your time. And I set him up with courses and all. And he, so I called the check in the wood a couple of days ago and we got to talking about trading. And he said, that one of his friends just mortgaged his house so he can get money out of his house to start trading. And I told him, and in proper English, of course, that'll work until it don't. So that's a little bit of a scary thing. Now, here's the thing I always kind of come back to. Can you time off of it? Is it need to know or need to know? And I think it's neat to know these things, but sometimes they can be a sign. And of course, always come back to the charts. Are they going up? Are they going down? Are they going sideways? But one has to wonder if the most pain is unfolding. Like I just said, the shorts have been absolutely punished. If you've never shorted before, you're in for a real treat. The retrace rallies absolutely suck. I have a new client actually an old client, but he's new to shorting. And initially he thought this was the coolest thing in cool town. And I'm like, hey, hey, let's just tap the brakes a little bit. Shorting is a lot tougher than it looks. And as I've said ad nauseum, the reason I like to short, not so much, well, actually so much to make money, right? Because it's the only way to make money when stocks go down. But the great thing about shorting is it really helps you to see both sides of the market. So the, the bottom fishers, and the shoe shine boys, I'd be willing to bet two things. One, without digressing too far, they have no money management, which is going to be scary if this thing turns back down. But number two, I guarantee you they don't know how to short and they don't know how to see both sides of the market. So if you know you can make money go when stocks go up or you can make money when stocks go down or any other market, for the most part, for that manner, then you're able to kind of see both sides of the market all you have to do i know my wife's always like you know all you have to do is just this one little thing and then six hours later i'm still trying to do that one little thing right but all you have to do is determine which way a market is headed and get on board and if you could short you can make money when the markets go down i know it sounds great until you actually short it gets stuck in a retrace rally now one thing that i'm thinking a lot about and i just talked about or hinted at is that market timing can be slow okay unless you're like we've got one guy in a group jim i don't know if you're here today but jim looks at the hourly bow ties and the hourly charts and i think that's great you got to be careful though because you're you're going to get more whipsaw in those charts you're also gonna look like a genius when you nail the low too so obviously in trading there's always a trade-off but market timing can be slow especially if you're looking at these longer term systems and as I've said in weeks past, some lag is actually okay to keep you from chasing your own tail. You gotta be really careful though with those whipsaw filters because if you put too many in, you'll end up buying right at the top because everything will finally line up 
and then you'll end up selling right at the bottom because everything will finally line up. But that's another conversation for another day. Now, as I said earlier, the TFM system, which does have a moving average component, but your sell signals come purely off of price, meaning that if price crosses, if closes below, I'm sorry, closes below the 50 week moving average and closes 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high, then you get a sell signal. And, and again, and I don't know why it's so shocking to me, but I just think it's fascinating that that happened so fast that the weekly signal triggered before the daily, if you look at it like a daily bow tie or something. But if you're looking at weekly moving average or something like the bow ties in proper order, then that's gonna be a little slow to turn, especially when the market makes a sharp turn. Now, the other thing to think about is these V-shaped recoveries are hard to catch. And obviously a lot of people were rewarded for catching that market bottom, but it could be that ignorance is bliss and we'll just have to see. And hopefully this guy who mortgaged his house has made enough money to pay that mortgage back off or whatever, his second loan or third loan or whatever it is. And he trades with the rest of the money. It's very dangerous buying into this overbought environment I often talk about priced for perfection, and I get a lot of questions on that. Well, we're in potentially an event-driven environment, and if the cure doesn't come as quickly as possible for this, I'm not going to say the word in case YouTube is monitoring. Well, they monitor all channels, and the algorithm will kick me out if I say that pesky little thing that's happening now, Mexican lager virus. I said virus, we'll really catch me on that. Anyway, if the cure or the vaccination or whatever the case may be, or the curve doesn't flatten quick enough, is the market priced for that perfection? How much is already priced in? Can the market handle more and more really bad reports? And that's one of those things that's hard to quantify but I'd be willing to bet at this point in time, the market is priced for perfection. And if not, it's certainly getting there. Now, one thing you have to remember, and this could be a little perverse because we're momentum guys and we chase momentum. But sometimes the old leaders become the new laggards. And I think Zoom could be our exhibit A there. Okay. Look at Zoom on a net-net basis. Where is it now? 137. Where was it this time back in March? About 137, okay? Or the middle of March, I should say. So at the least, it's lost quite a bit of steam. It's certainly lower than it was at least a month ago. So this has me a little concerned. This aberration or, or whatever you want to call it, is that when you get these early new leaders, if the market does keep going higher, then sometimes these new leaders can be a source of funds. So some of these V-shaped recoveries in these biotechs could become a source of funds. And then what's interesting is, and I don't have the gentleman's name, I didn't have time to do the research, I'll have to find out for next week. But I saw a very interesting presentation back last year, before all this mess got started, obviously, when I was speaking in San Francisco. And he was explaining how the value stocks can actually become momentum stocks when you have a big market turn or if those, for instance, I often talk about like the Phoenix strategy. And all that is, is you look at a stock that goes down and just dies out for months and months and months and months and months, sometimes years. And oil and energy stocks could be a good example of this. Although right now, their recovery is going to be a little bit more spiky for now at least. But if these oil stocks go back down to old lows and stay there for a month or two or three or four or five or six, the longer the better to work out all that supply and have everybody pretty much give up on them, those stocks can double and triple 
over a short period of time. So those value stocks can become momentum stocks. Now I'm a momentum trader and I don't, I don't discriminate, right? So sometimes I might be buying value stocks. Sometimes I might be buying crazy biotechs, whatever's moving, right? Somebody said that early in my career, before I even started this career, when I was just trading with a day job, somebody said, if Dave heard that intravenous drug use was on the rise, he would buy needles. I said, well, I don't know if it's that true, but drug use is not on the rise, is it? And I guess the other thing is now would actually look at a needles chart, which by the way, might be worth trading. Make a note of that. Now this is left over from last week and obviously things have improved greatly since then, today notwithstanding. Although I do think we have the potential to roll back over, I will believe in what I see and not in what I believe. And things have improved quite a bit since last week, again. And I think that we will correct a little bit from overbought and I think the nature of that correction is going to be really important. When we get to the live charts, I'm going to walk you through that. As I said before, there's a lot to unwind. The shorts have been squeezed. That's mission accomplished there. If we stay negative for a while, those who need money might need to start taking money out of the market. Unemployment is shooting through the roof. I know I'm a confusing issue with facts, but sometimes I need a think about things unfolding just so I can kind of wrap my head around things and of course use the charts first and foremost. When do these newly minted quarantine traders begin to run for the door? And if you are one of these newly minted quarantine traders, I'm glad to have you. But like I said in my article, the latest random thoughts, most of these guys, and I'd be willing to bet a million bucks, pretty much all of these guys, right? wouldn't know money management if it hit them in the ass. And money management is a really, really tough lesson to learn from experience. I know experience is the best teacher, but it can be really hard. And, you know, I feel for that guy. I've never been shot on Friday, believe me. But that poor bastard that mortgages his house, when, not if, this thing stops working because he's got a tailwind behind him right now, right? But when, not if, it stops working, it can get pretty ugly pretty fast. And probably all of these people who piled into Zoom because it was a story stock and made a lot of sense will be stuck with this stock when it begins to roll over in earnest. And when we see a bow tie there or a first thrust there, I will likely be shorting that stock. Now, not because it's a story stock or whatever, okay? Don't confuse the issue with facts. But if I get the signal, especially since leaders can become laggards really quick, I will definitely take it. So I still think there's a lot to unwind. Last week we talked about oil going negative, negative 37.63 a barrel, negative 37, negative 38. What's the difference, right? And that's because there was no place to put the oil. So you would actually get paid to take the oil. I think we're in a possible event-driven market. I try to avoid the news, but I get a lot through osmosis. And there's a little news widget on my data feed. And truth be told, on these opening gap reversals, if I'm looking to play an ogre, as we call them now, in a pullback or something on an individual stock, I will look at the news just to see what caused the the ogre sometimes not all the time but sometimes i will but i do get a little news here and there through osmosis and just the nature of this market is i think we're in a potential event driven environment what does that mean well if they come out with a vaccination tonight or if they find out that ingesting some sort of disinfectant is good for you don't go out and do that by the way or light brought into the body is good for you, which I'm long, uh, what's the name of that stock? Let me walk over my quote screen. I have a token position in AYTU, which is bringing light into the body. So that wasn't such a crazy thing, right? It sounded crazy at the time. UV light inside the body, ah, ha, ha, that's funny. Well, they're bringing UV light inside the body. They got a little tube that lights up with some UV light. They're sticking it down your throat and 
And hopefully, not just because I'm long, which I almost got shaken out this morning, but hopefully, uh, man, I have to check my stops. Hopefully, it stopped out. But hopefully, it will kill the virus. And hopefully, we have a way to kill the virus by bringing light inside of your body. Well, if that flops and other things flop, who knows? But I think we're in this possible event driven environment. One thing scary is there's a lot of longer term things that have to unwind. It's it's used, and I know I'm confusing the issue with facts, but there's some hedge funds that probably blew up on the oil deal. There's liquidity coming into the market, artificial liquidity, you can argue. And these things sometimes take time to unwind. So again, we're gonna just follow price, but this is in the back of my head. And maybe some artificial buying is coming into the market from either the governments or these quarantine traders who have mortgaged their houses. But again, I don't want to confuse the issue with facts. All right, well, let's get over to the live charts. You guys can start asking about individual issues and if, or your favorite stock pick, whatever you want to call them, stock picks. If you are a member of DaveLander.com, you have to be a gold member. Let's keep the riffraff out. Join Dave Landry Trend Traders. And there you can interact with other traders. One of you guys, was it you, John, who's here today, came up with a possible pattern. And I call the return to paradise. I think he called the double tap. Double tap sounds kind of negative, though. Let me think about that. So we need to come up with a good name for that. But for lack of a better word, we'll take a look at that. I keep forgetting the symbol name. A-Y-T-U, and that's why I bought a token position there, just for fun. So anyway, you can interact with other traders, ask for help. I This morning, somebody emailed me a couple times, and I emailed them two or three times back and said, look, bring it up in the group. Let's noodle with this thing there. Let's talk about it there and let everybody else chime in. Sometimes I'll bring up a stock, and I think it's pretty good. Not that I'm the grand pumba or anything, but I'll bring it up, and you guys will pick it apart a little bit, and sometimes I see things that I didn't see. So... I think it's important to have a community of traders, especially, and I don't want to be too biased, but especially a community of like-minded traders that are trading something that's simplified and conceptually correct and not crazy stuff and a thousand indicators and so on and so forth. So you'll see, and the other thing too is sometimes I'll put out signs and signals of things that I'm seeing there and then Occasionally, I'll throw out an opening gap reversal trade, although I've been a little gun, gun shy lately to throw them out. I have been working to perfect those, and I will be putting some of those out as I see them, of course. Okay. And the way you become a member is you go to DaveLander.com slash members, and you can start for free, except that your benefits obviously will be limited. Yeah, Steve, uh, you read my mind. That's that's the the opening gap reversal from yesterday and i literally had you know that's that's a lesson in trading psychology right there as i was saying yesterday in my stock charts tv show it's like i think the reason that that at least i think i'm pretty good with a lot of this psychology stuff and study it so much is that i'm my own subject and in that particular stock we had a nice opening gap reversal i had an order in place but being punished from my shorts okay being punished from some of my day trading, being punished from being bearish, had me a little gun shy. And I said, you know, I, I just think I'm gonna go ahead and pull this order because I got a lot going on and I just don't wanna mess with it. Maybe it's maybe it's intuition and not intuition. And lo and behold, it would have made me a little bit of money. It would have been very nice. So that's a, that was an opening gap reversal and a pullback. And I'll show you that in just one second. All right, let's take a look at the market and keep the questions coming because we'll have plenty of time to get to all your stuff today. So we take a look at the S&P 500. First of all, we're very overbought, okay? Dave, how do you measure overbought? Well, I don't use oscillators or anything like that. But since the March lows, let's measure that on a, I could, let's do a closing basis. We ran 31%. Wow, I didn't even realize it was that big. That's huge. I feel like tiny Elvis. Look at that. Look at that rally. It's huge, right? And that's a long ways to go in a short amount of time, especially on the upside. 
by the way, one thing I was thinking before I went live is that the buy and hold crowd, they say things like, well, if you miss the 50th, 50 greatest days in history, then your performance is really bad. Well, if you miss the 50 worst days in history, then your performance is really good. And no, I didn't have that. Let me see that, see if I got that spreadsheet real quick. Early in the presentation, I said we'd discuss the results real quick. With the market coming back, now this number, see this is as of yesterday's close. This number looked a lot worse, obviously, worse, obviously when we're closer to the March lows, or at the March lows, I should say. And this number obviously looked a little better. Now this number is not gonna get better until we buy back in. The thing that, if you just look at this, you know, it's like, well, Dave, that looks okay. You really didn't beat buy and hold by much. You did make some trades. Well, it's only 11 trades in 31 years, which isn't too much, right? But what you avoid is an additional 44% slide or a 52% slide or a 28% slide, okay? Now you could argue, well, you're not, you're not back in the market. So it's like, well, maybe the, uh, the slide ain't over yet, okay? And the importance of some sort of market timing is so you don't lose half of your retirement right before you retire, or if you don't lose half your money, period, if you're longer term oriented, obviously. And what's kind of cool is this this system does stay out of the market about 20% of the time. Right now, you'd be out of the market. So six and a half years out of these 31 years that I have in here. Also, what's kind of cool is when I started going back to the 20s, these numbers comparatively are gonna look a lot better. In other words, once you factor in like a 90% drop, which probably had about an 80% diaper change, right? In 29 and subsequent markets, poor markets like the 70s and all, then these numbers down here are gonna look a little better. So sorry about not getting that out, but that's something I just wanted to point out. Let's get back to those charts. Again, as I was saying, SP 500, super, super overbought. To me, it still looks like a big picture, deep retracement, as I often say. When in doubt, take the charts out, okay? Now, but Dave, when will you become bullish? Well, I don't know. If we take out yesterday's high, then I think I might be forced. And if we sell off enough in here, we should start, see, start seeing some decent long side setups. Right now, part of the problem, and it'll probably get fleshed out as we look at some of your stock picks, is that volatility is so insane, a lot of these stocks are wide and loose and all over the place, and maybe they've gone straight up for the last three or four weeks because they got a cure. Oh, damn it, I said it, I have to beat that out. <laughs> because they're gonna cure the Mexican lager virus or whatever. How long can they sustain themselves? And is it worth going in with that crazy risky volatility? And here's the deal. Look at the volatility of this overall market. And you know, I like to point out my own flaws in trading because my flaws a lot of times are similar to yours. And I think you can learn from my mistakes. And maybe I didn't fully adjust to the volatility of this market. And as I was saying in last night's trading service, I don't ever remember an HV on a 50-day basis of the S&P 500 at 69. That is just ludicrous. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous, right? So I find that kind of interesting. I do have the HV ratio right here. So we are running at about half of the volatility that we've seen over the last 50 days, which is, this is kind of fascinating in and of itself. So what could happen is if this stays low for a while, we could get an expansion of volatility. The only problem is it doesn't tell you which way the volatility is going to expand, up or down. If I had to guess, based on this overbought market, I would say down, but hey, one day at a time. And again, if the market does sell off within reason, 
I'm going to start seeing some long side setups. Now let's take a look at the 50 day moving average. You can see we've got Landry light above it, meaning the lows are greater than the 50 day moving average. And keep in mind that this moving average, as we start dropping off more prices and adding in prices, will begin to eventually turn back up in here. Right now, the slope is still headed lower. Okay. And and by the way, that's something which is slow to catch up sometimes, but that's something that you could help time a market with is a slope of a moving average. Okay. But so far, we've got Landry Light above that moving average. So obviously improving, as I said earlier, on a weekly basis, though, we still have a weekly bow tie to the downside. Now let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ's had quite the impressive rally, too. In fact, let's just measure it. See if I can pick a pretty low low here. This might be the lowest low. I wish you can go low to high, but that's 30%. Okay, like the piece, very similar. But as you can see, it's now well above its 50 day moving average. And what's kind of interesting is we're really not that far from all time highs. My big concern, as I preach quite often, is when you have a V-shaped recovery at high levels like this, by the time the market gets all the way back to its old highs, it's already overbought, and it's very hard for that market to sustain that rally. Now, you could confuse the issue with facts and interject some logic and say, well, who's left to buy and how much liquidity is left to come into the market, and so on and so forth. The biggest, I think the, the most pain to the most amount of people would be for this market to roll back over and unfortunately punish the newly minted quarantine traders, the poor guy that mortgages his house as a kind of beating a dead horse on, and the buying hopes who are getting a little smug right now and they're quick to say, I told you so. All the money managers who advised my friends to don't get shaken out and the friends who followed along it would punish them too. Not that I want any of this to happen. As I often say, I don't mind getting stopped out of all my shorts as long as I start getting some longs to buy along the way. Just got an alert on something. Hopefully it was a good one. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Now the Rusty was a big old fat laggard. And then all of a sudden something lit a fire under its buttocks. And now you can see we have a little Landry light above the 50 day moving average, which is kind of interesting. Let's take a look at the weekly here real quick. Weekly chart, not quite as good, right? I feel like Tarzan speak. Weekly chart, not good. <laughs> so you've got a weekly bow tie working there too. So once again, you've got daily versus weekly, what's going to win out. Bow tie here is going to be kind of sloppy too. We had a crossing way back here. And usually I like to see three, four bars. Look, we head back here. Three or four bars comes together tightly. You kind of can see them all stuck at the same point as opposed to a crossing here and then maybe a later crossing here. And then actually these two haven't crossed just yet. So you still have one more crossing left. So it's taken weeks for that to unfold. So I wouldn't rush out and call that a bow tie. But yeah, if we have uptrend proper order, then obviously that would be a good thing. Now, as we go through the sectors, a lot of them kind of look like the overall market, big fat retraces, okay? Gold, obviously being the exception, gold has broken out, okay? And now it's begun to pull back a little bit. Will gold continue to lead if the market continues higher? Well, here's a case, and I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but why is gold rallying? Maybe there's some bad things going on. My Cajun just slipped out. You heard that? People say, I don't, you don't sound Cajun. Well, it's because I have to work to not sound Cajun. It's bad. <laughs> but some of those bad things in the market or bad things in the world, right, could happen. And if things begin to improve, one has to wonder if gold will continue higher. Now, that doesn't mean that if I start seeing some gold setups, I'm not going to take them. My concern would be though, V-shaped recovery at high levels, but so far we've broken out to new highs. So possibly see some gold setting up soon. I wouldn't rush out and anticipate that. Gold, the commodity recently broke out, but now it's beginning to come back in a little bit. 
I'm wondering if things improve, will gold the commodity come back into this range, if you want to call it that, wide and loose range? And will that negate some of the bullishness that we're seeing within the goals? Some of these areas, like the banks, really haven't gotten off their buttocks just yet, okay? Now, longer term, banks might be the next value stocks. We'll just have to wait and see. Value stocks turn momentum is what I like to say, mean to say. Drug stocks, another V-shaped recovery at high levels, did bounce off the old highs a little bit in here. Biotech, same sort of action, got a little bit higher than the drugs, and then they came back in. Now, you look at this biotech sector and you think, oh, man, I'm going to go get some long some biotechs. Well, these stocks are just wild and crazy and very hard to go in and trade these wild and crazy stocks. Health services stalling a little short of their prior highs in here. That's a little concerning. If I saw some shorts here that look really good, I might consider them, okay? Retail, one of those sectors that's defied gravity, not quite back to its old highs though. It'd be interesting to see if it can close the gap here. Gaps tend to be resistance. People think gaps get closed. Not true. Gaps tend to be resistance, okay? And support. Semiconductors have been doing really well in here. But as you can see today, turning down with a little vigor, giving up most of yesterday's gains okay so if we give up that becomes a do-over and this begins to sell off fairly hard i'd be a little concerned about that also bigger picture wise i like to look at little pivot points and you can see that we're shy of this pivot point here kind of in the spirit of the witch hat pattern so we'll have to keep an eye on that bonds are all over the place but have tightened up as of late as you can see bonds imploded came back and now they're just kind of bouncing around in here look at that tlt 41 that's another one of those numbers that I don't remember. You know, maybe many, many years ago, it was that high when we had some sort of, I forget, that some sort of squeeze in place in bonds. It escapes me. Maybe it's something I'm trying to forget. All right, let's go ahead and start banging out. Boy, you guys are active today. Fantastic. Let's start taking a look at some of these stocks in here. I and O. Now, that's a crazy one. John was talking about this return to paradise pattern or double tap. And I like the way he thinks. Some of these stocks are going crazy. They shoot up, they come back in, they base, okay? And then they take off again, okay? There's really no setup that I would actually trade here because I look for a pullback and not a pullback within like a bigger picture pattern. But I am beginning to study these return to paradise patterns. I was kind of thinking they, they kind of look like the bull horns you make with your with your fingers, you know? <laughs> so that might be a name for the pattern. And I'm trying to wrap my head around the conceptually correct, or if it is even conceptually correct, do these stocks have all this excitement, they come back in and then they have that, that second shot higher, as I think John calls it, the double tap. So no, I wouldn't go after this one per se. If it pulled back a little bit, then yeah, I hear you. It, it, it's a pullback. Also, a pullback after a base breakout is not a bad thing, but with all this trading over here, I would be concerned. Now, with that said, I can never remember the symbol on that stupid stock, AYTU. So this is another one of those stocks that could be that, that pattern. Usually, I wouldn't touch a stock like this with a 10-foot pole. I literally only have, I don't know why I have to say literally, but I only have 1,000 shares, so it's not going to make or break me, but it is kind of interesting. It took off came back in, and then now it's going to try to, I hate to use the word hold, but hopefully return to paradise, but we'll see. But yeah, that's been a bumpy ride. And usually, keep in mind that usually with a pattern, I'll study it for months and months and months. With this pattern, though, I'm not sure if we're going to have months and months to study it because it might just be an aberration. Okay, Donald, that's on the Landry list. We'll go ahead and cover it, though. It's, it's so crazy. I don't think I'm going to recommend it. Look at the HV. As I told my service peeps last night and nights prior, I think the highest HV stock ever recommended was like 140 or something. It was a little low price uranium stock, or I'm gonna to try to say the rare earth and hope I don't mess it up. Molybdium, molybdium, I can never say that, but I, it's anyway, it was a rare earth stock or uranium stock. 
And it's the highest HV stock I ever remember recommended. Now, if I have to adjust to the market, then I will adjust to the market and trade stocks that are higher in HV. This looks interesting. What scares me is let's 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 do this. Let's measure this run. This stock ran 558%. Okay. So for me to go after it, it would have to have a pretty deep correction, okay? Much deeper than what it has already ha had. So I wouldn't consider it a setup right now. If you did go after it, whew, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. I would think, as crazy as it sounds, it would require at least a four point stop. And in this stock, that's what, 40%? That's just ludicrous. All right, let's take a look at Billy, 28 or so. Um, I'm not a big fan of these high-level V-shaped things, okay? I mean, I hear you, Dakota. And if we were looking at, there's a way to do it. If you're just looking at this extreme right side of the chart, yeah, you've got a nice persistent trend. And I'd actually like to see a little bit more pullback. Now, if you back the chart way out, more pullback would put you further into this soup and suggest this was a false breakout. And then you'd actually have resistance at these prior highs. So I would pass on that. Now, keep in mind, my methodology isn't a be all end all. And I'm having a hard time finding decent setups on the long side, short side too. Short side, I'm seeing all these big, big deep picture retracements that I think have potential, but I'm not going after them because they don't really fit the methodology. And since we have a little time, I'll give you an example. I think like ACGL, this is one of our shorts. And if you take a look at the bow tie here, it doesn't get any more textbook than this. In fact, Traders Magazine asked me to update an article and I might have to use this particular stock as a perfect little setup, cherry picked, so to speak, but hey, Learn how to cherry pick and you'll own, you'll own the world eventually, right? If you're getting good at it, I'm still learning. But anyway, I like these shorts over these, just kind of emerging from big picture tops, but there's a lot of shorts out there, these stocks, and that's not a great example. Let me see if I can find you one without getting into the Landry list. TJ Maxx is okay, that have made these big, deep, picture retracements okay and they look like they're in a lot of trouble but they don't fit the methodology so on the, on the long side everything's so damn wild and crazy you got all these biotechs that are just absolutely wild and crazy okay let's just drill down to the sector here a little bit and then we'll i promise you i'll get to all your stock picks before i leave So if we jump to this change watch list to sub industry, and then let's sort these by volume, just to get the little ones out the way. But as you go through these biotechs, look how wild and crazy, HV 468, I'm actually long that one. That's the stock that brings a light inside your body and nearly stopped out this morning. Even Gilead, well, Jilly, it's all over the place, as you can see. This one looks pretty good, but again, crazy, crazy HV. It'll have to pull back a little bit more. This is one that's been on my watch list for a while. I'd suggest you put that in your watch list. Anyway, my point being, look how crazy these things are. HV 162, HV 192, 300, 246. John, is that Return to Paradise? Check that out. That one looks good, okay, HV 189. I might go after this one, okay, I like it. But look, this crazy, it shot up, it came back in, and now it shot up again. And yeah, it's trending higher, but it's got a little Jackie Mason look to it. So a lot of the stocks you guys would probably talk about today, they're just so volatile. I have to wrap my head around whether or not I want to go after that extreme volatility. And the problem is, you're gonna have to reduce your shares so much, okay, that it may not be worth going after. Now, this is one that I nearly played yesterday. And again, I got a little gun shy. And what I liked about it was you had that daily setup 
and this was a an intraday trade. I would I don't stop short of calling it a day trade. But notice this nice, nice opening gap reversal. And unfortunately, it didn't work out. But it's like, well, I'm looking for at least a point. This thing's probably not going to go a whole point, And lo and behold, it went a whole point um, from the entry. But this was the one I wanted to show you guys, at least in a group, as a possible opening gap reversal. So you come in, you've got a stock that's in a trend, a persistent trend. And then it's also in an accelerating trend. It gaps lower, sells off a little bit. Your entry becomes above that intraday high. Takes the partial profits intraday, trail your stop intraday, and all those things we talk about in the Q&A, trading the open and gap reversals. This is not the bread and butter, but every now and then you can come in and pick up a couple of grand. Even 500 bucks is plenty, right? For a day trade, you know? 500 bucks is what, about 125 grand a year? If you could do that every day. Problem is you can't do that every day and some days you lose 500 bucks or more and that is minus 127, 125 a year. But yeah, now longer term, and, and this was part of my, I guess, trepidation with the stock and why one of the reasons I didn't take it is that it has a lot of overhead resistance, but I kind of halfway reason that, well, we're not gonna even get there anyway intraday on a day trade. So why not? But I would pass on this stock and keep in mind, maybe I look for too much perfection. I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think I miss a lot of decent trades because of that. And I think it's important to look for perfection, at least longer term in the markets, even though some of these wild and crazy stocks have done well. But you do have some overhead supply here. I mean, I hear you, nice uptrend, accelerate uptrend, kind of a TKO type of move. I think it can go up and challenge those prior highs, but I think it's gonna have a little trouble getting through that resistance. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass on that one. GNMK, GNMK. Well, here's the deal, Zach. What do we trade? Pullbacks? It has not pulled back yet. So yeah, if you wanna put that on your momentum list, by all means, but boy, it looks fantastic. A couple things. Look at the HV, okay? Tiny Elvis again. Look at that HV, it's huge. I need to figure out a way to get a little tiny Elvis in here to have him pop up every time we got an HV over 150 or 100, I guess. So yeah, on a pullback, it might be worthwhile, but look at the beast you're dealing with, okay? This thing would probably have to pull back to like nine, okay? to be a serious trend knockout or pullback. So we'll just have to wait and see on that one. And then in the back of my head, not to confuse the issue with facts, is how much longer are all these little crazy diagnostic companies and biotechs on things of that nature, how much longer or is there gonna be all this excitement in these stocks? I don't know. And maybe I shouldn't even think about that, but it's going to have to pull back a little bit. All right, Stuart wants to take a look at INCY. Okay, INCY actually has one of the lower HVs out there. Look at that, 58, okay, which is still kind of crazy. Um, kind of wide and loose and all over the place, longer term. You know, here's my question, and, and again, maybe I'm confusing the issue with facts, but you just had this big old rally here. You have a big old rally all over the place on all these stocks. Can they have another big old rally? I don't know. I think it would have to pull back a little bit further. And if it did, it'd be back below these lows in here. So I, I'm not going to go with a hard no on this one. I just, I do have concerns about the fact that it could pull back below this prior little peak and actually would have to in order to make it trading worthwhile. And once again, though, Stuart, I mean, take a look at this chart over the intermediate term. Look at that nice persistent uptrend followed by a pullback. This would almost be a textbook setup at any other time, except that a lot of these stocks have all this wild, wide and loose, crazy trading going back in time. LM and X. Okay. Yeah, it's trending, Stuart, but we'll have to, we'll need a pullback, okay? But yeah, put that on your momentum list. And, you know, I was tracking a momentum list and often I do track momentum list, but lately just because my software, I'll catch it and because I'm looking at 3,000 stocks anyway, 
I haven't really bothered to put together a momentum list, but mRNA, LMNX, whatever that one we just looked at for Zach, you know, obviously anything that's going straight up, put that on your momentum list. Did we look at RNSG? Yeah, this looks pretty good. Who's that, Chris A? We got a lot of Chris's in the group. A little bit of a gap here, but hey, you know, volatility is so whack and everything. I'm not gonna split hairs on a little gap. Usually I'm not a fan of gaps. This actually needs a little bit more knockout, but that's pretty good. I would not, this would certainly make my call list for tomorrow, okay? I need to see how today shakes out. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback. And yeah, that might be worth a shot, okay? I like to know what they do too. Not that I'm going to say I'm not going to go after one industry or the other, but I'd be interested to see what industry they're in and if other stocks within that industry are trending. SCO as an ogre for today. SCO, that's going to be one of those. Okay, Zach, I, as I've said quite a bit before, you really want to be careful what these commodity based especially if they're commodity-based, inverse, short, leveraged ETFs. You can get into a lot of trouble really fast. Uh, I could show you my account <laughs> if you don't believe me. So as a general statement, I would pass on these things, but I hear you. It gap lower, it came back in. So yeah, that's an opening gap reversal, if that's the question for sure. But be damn careful with those things. You can get a lot of trouble really fast. And the thing is, the futures trade outside of stocks, so a lot of the gap that you see is or can be artificial. PD, I've just warned Zach about those many times, and, and he keeps bringing them up. <laughs> First thing I see about PD is I see a big wad of overhead resistance. Am I correct? Yeah, so you got a lot of overhead supply. I mean, you know, here's the thing. In this freaking market, there's so much buying that comes in on these stocks who knows you know i mean maybe it'll just push right through that overhead supply but sticking to my methodology longer term and not looking to hurry up and change a bunch of things and create a lot of new rules and change the way i do things now i'm not opposed to bending the way i do things a little bit okay but yeah i hear you nice little bow tie in here coming off of uh how many year lows is that all-time lows I mean, it's got a lot going for it. It looks pretty good, but I don't like this big old mound of overhead supply. I saw somebody recently talk about some little stock coming off of Lowe's, and it looked fantastic, but it had as much or more overhead supply as this. And I saw all the comments on YouTube, and people were going absolutely nuts because this lady recommended this stock, and she was already long which is good for her, and, and I thought it looked like a good setup. It looked a lot like this setup here, but there's so much overhead supply, but I was amazed to see how many people jump in with excitement, and that one person noticed that there was a lot of overhead supply. So I think that we're in a, a market of a lot of retail mania, as Citron, Citron Research calls it. S-Gen, that's probably gonna be a biotech, right? Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, this is not bad. Now, see, I like the fact that this is okay because it had it had like a little shakeout of this base and then it took out the top. As I've said before, it's not a pattern I trade. I don't think it'd be hard to quantify. But as a general statement, if you wait for stocks to break down below a base and then buy the base breakout to the upside, it will test out, okay? and maybe I shouldn't use the word test out because it's hard to quantify, but from empirical research, which is a fancy way of saying, looking at a lot of charts, that's a good pattern. So yeah, uh, who asked about that? Chris, Chris A? Yeah, I mean, I like this. I like first pullbacks at the base breakout. So I'm gonna give you a high five on that one. It needs a little bit more pullback though, okay? Maybe a pullback to about 130-ish, and then I'll reevaluate that. But sure, if I was seeing that and it pulled back, and set up, I would go after it. ABT, is that Abbott? I haven't seen that stock in a long time. Yeah, this is a little bit more V-shaped recovery on this one. And Abbott can be really choppy, but it's worked its way higher longer term for sure. Yeah, I just don't like the V-shaped recovery aspect to it. And then if it, it needs, 
yeah, it's kind of pulled back to where it broke out. So I would pass on that one. Okay, Donald says, most market timing strategies are slow to recognize the bottom of the 2008-2009 financial crisis. It looked like it'll be no different this time. I, I don't know what you mean by most most market timing, Chris, because, or Donald, I'm, I'm sorry, because Donald's saying most market timing strategies are slow in 2008, 2009. Uh, I don't know, 2008, 2009, I think a lot of my stuff started kicking in back then. Um, but yeah, I hear what you're saying, those V-shaped recoveries at a bottom, 2008, 2009. Now, I know that the, the weekly stuff, my weekly stuff took a while to catch up. Let's see where we are here. Let's see when the daily bow tie occurred. Is this the bottom? Let's see, 2008, 2009. I seem to remember buying stocks fairly early in the process. You had a daily bow tie here and you had a little bit of resistance, but it was a bow tie signal nonetheless in March of 2009. And then on a weekly basis, it took a little while to catch up, but you were still long fairly early in 2009 or by certainly by mid-year. So I don't know about that. I'd have to see some specific examples, but yeah, if you're trend following, you can, um, if you're trend following, you can be a little late because in order to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow, right? Return to Paris or Gatekeeper for which particular for a particular stock? Okay, CSPR. That's one. That, that one's got a few issues, Zach. But I hear you. I mean, it's worked its way higher. It's got a little bit of overhead supply to deal with. Okay. Um, it's an IPO, which is a good thing, but. What do they do? I kind of like to see a little bit of a story behind an IPO. Not to confuse the issue with facts, like I once did with Lulu Lemon, but I would pass on that one. It's got a little bit of overhead supply. Miso. <laughs> Miso. Miso. Don't say the rest of that. Uh, no, that's too crazy. Look at that. Look at that HV. That's huge. 266. And. Uh, Let's see what happened here. Okay, HV is two, you know, it's just a one and done type. It's like one huge thing higher now. Can it base and return to paradise? I don't know. We're still trying to flesh out that pattern. So maybe this will be one to watch for that. But we're just one day, a one day blast higher. I I wouldn't go after this particular, particular stock. Is that why you're laughing? Because of miso? Miso. <laughs> oh, geez. Was on my gap scan yesterday. Okay. All right, TSX. In the T. Okay, Stuart is long TSX. Hopefully, we could have some good things. Oh, TSX, you mean Toronto Exchange? You're long. What are you long, Stuart? Every time I hear Stuart, it reminds me of the, the Californians. Stuart, what are you doing here? ARCT. Yeah, Zach, I hear you, buddy, but that's just a momentum stock. I hear you. Yeah. Oh, this, why do I know this stock? I was long this. Oh, here's, this is painful. <laughs> Seemed like I was long this stock not long ago. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, put that on your momentum list. Yeah, we got a little lag. What is communications? The pager company? Who is a pager anymore? Except for Allen. This is kind of interesting. The range is a little tight for an IPO. The volume is a little bit light. You could end up with a Hotel California situation. Good volume first day. Yeah, not much volume today, but kind of interesting. I usually like a little bit more range. And the buy at B pattern, you would buy on a close above 27, which I know it's above the, it's above $20 a share. This looks okay. I, I'd, I'd have to noodle with a little bit more. 
but yeah, let's see. This is day five. So who who brought this up? Good eye on that, John. Um, we could um, we could see a buy at B setup here. In fact, it would just have to close above this closing high. Nope, this closing high here. So yeah, any close, let's say 26.75, about where we are now, or higher, 26.70 or higher would be a buy based on that setup. I need to look at it a little bit more. I'm just not sure if the range is 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 quite enough on that, but I certainly think you could do much worse than that. So good job on that, and I'm gonna give you a high five. BNTX, BDTX, secondary signal, BDTX. Yeah, let's see. It's a little thin, not horribly thin, but I would check the spread. It's only traded what 30,000 shares so far today. It is an IPO. I hear you. I'm I'm not so worried about IPOs as long as they're making new highs. If they have a little, when they get past their prior highs back here, so I would yeah I would play a pullback on that. Zach, good eye on that. Good job, but it's gonna have to pull back a little bit more for me. Um, I don't know if I would rush in and just play the new closing high on that one since it's been established for a little while. I think I would let it pull back a little further and it might be worth a shot. It's kind of cup and handily, you know, so I, I think that's okay. Miso, yeah, we talked about that. Miso. There's, there are way too many longs to go after, hard to call. Well, not really. I mean, I'm, it, maybe after today, um, but they really haven't pulled back enough just yet. Let's take a look at the spiders. And if you look at the spiders, spiders only off percent and a half today. So the spiders really hadn't pulled back. So the market's going to have to sell off a little bit for us to get pullbacks. Okay. So I'm not seeing too many. But yeah, tonight, maybe when I'm doing my scan, I'll be like, holy crap, there's 10,000 pullbacks. Well, actually, it would only be about two or 3,000 at most, but still quite a few. But I hear you. LBGO. Yeah, I like this one. Uh, that's a good looking stock. Who who said that? Chris, Chris, hey, you're on fire today, buddy. A little stuff back here, but it's new enough to where that doesn't matter. Yeah, it needs a little bit more pullback, though. A little bit more pullback. So I can't give you a high five until the pull's back. But yeah, this is something that you might see on my trading service. So rare, great persistency, but going crazy. And that's, you know, it's kind of funny. That's a... Um, Earlier, I said rare earths. They're probably using rare earths to do their. Uh... Well, see, this isn't a V shaped recovery at high levels because it came off of lows. Um, if I was just seeing this today, or let me just rewind that. If I was just seeing this a year ago, <laughs> I'd say this stock is too wild and crazy and too wide and loose for me to trade. But I might have to back off a little bit on some of those things I've been saying because. These might be the stocks that we end up trading. So yeah, a little bit more pullback. It would pull back past this little peak, but I, I don't know. I'll have to. I'll know it when I see it. But I'm, I'll probably pass on that because I would have to bend some rules. But yeah, on a pullback, I, I hear you, John. Great. Yeah, yeah. You kind of answer your own question. Great persistency, but great history, but crazy history. In this case, would the persistency override the negative or some of the wild past? Yeah, and that's the thing that, that you know what, I haven't wrapped my head around that yet. So that's a great point. And that's why I've been showing you, if you, you kind of uh, you kind of read my mind what I was thinking about some of these, or I think earlier, remember I said, hey, if you were just seeing this in a chart, my God, how good does that look, okay? But it's when you see the whole picture, you have to think twice. You know, it's electrocardiogram. Personalities do change. We are in kind of a new environment here, uncharted territories. So I haven't, I don't have that answer just yet, John, on whether or not we are now going to go after some of these ones that look good over the short term, but longer term have some issues. JWE, I think we looked at that one, or we tried. Yeah, it's not coming up here. Is that a um, Canadian stock or something? Gap referring, gap skin referring to here. Yeah, uh, good job on that. Uh, catch on that. I'm currently using Finviz for my gap scans. I did write one for or uh, telechart. I find it a little slow and I can't see them before the market opens. So, yeah, I don't have that one. Uh, JWL Toronto Exchange. 
two point spread on what? The problem is these questions come in and they don't come in order. M, C, F, T. Ooh, we're out of time, but let me get a few more in. Yeah, this looks okay. You have to evaluate the bad memories. Um, people looking to get out of break even. I, I would pass because I know it'd be a good problem to have, but once it hits around eh, 14 or so, it's liable to hit some overhead supply. Um, and it would take a little bit more pullback in here. So if you're willing to just make four points, 40%, I guess, better than poking the eye, right? But I would go ahead and pass based on that overhead supply. Where would you set your stop on O N E M? That's an old one of mine. I seem to remember that one. Um, I guess in this case it's an IPO, so you would use some sort of breakout strategy. Uh, probably about three points at least. Maybe four would be a little bit more conservative. H V is one nineteen, so it's pretty crazy. Although it doesn't look that crazy, right? I guess it's all relative. Kind of like incest. <laughs> I probably just got demonetized. <laughs> um, yeah, this is uh, this is Nancy Pelosi stock, huh? Um, it's kind of like, you know, not that I would trade this pattern, but it's sort of a big picture retrace that stalled out. It looks like it wants to come down here and test the old lows. I wouldn't actually short it, but it just doesn't look that good. Um, certainly not on the long side. Oh, you're short. Okay. He's short at 132.85. Yeah. I mean, it looks like it could be in trouble. So hopefully I answered, uh, correctly here. I personally wouldn't go out and short it, but this is kind of an example that big picture retrace pattern we're talking about, or I've been talking about where these things, yeah, they've, they've rallied over short term. They still look like they could be in trouble longer term. It's a little bit against the methodology because you're like, well, Dave, isn't that a big trend from 115 to 145? It's like, yeah, but just the way it unfolds in that big picture retrace, it could be in trouble. Well, look, guys and girls, we're out of time, so we're going to have to go ahead and shut things down. I really appreciate you guys and girls showing up, especially as hard as the show has been to find lately. And if you guys are watching the recording of this and you can't find the show, let me know. We need to figure out why that's happening. We used to have about 10 times the amount of people here that we used to, unless I ran them all off. <laughs> everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody stay safe, stay sane, and may the trend be with you.